forward to our time of worship together. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 293, The Lord's My Shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make within the past of righteousness in for his own name's sake yea though i walk through death's dark veil yet will i fear no will my head me and thy rod and staff me comfort still. My table thou hast furnished in presence of my foes. My head thou dost with all a note and my cup overflows goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me and in god's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be psalm 23 precious psalm if you will look with me in your bible to ezekiel chapter 2 last time i'd read from verse 1 down to verse 5 even though this is not a long chapter but so much there as we saw how the lord raised up Ezekiel to go preach to a people that the Lord had hardened. Some people find that mysterious. Why would God send a prophet to people that he'd hardened? Well, it's because he's God. And he doesn't have to save anybody. It's a reminder that if any are, it's going to be by his grace and grace alone. And for the most part, I dare say in our generation, we preach to a hardened people religious but ignorant of God's word ignorant of Christ they'd rather take the word of their preacher rather than the word of God and they blindly follow after men in fact a lot of preachers like it that way they want you to hang your brain at the door when you come in and you bow and you listen and if you ever question they're going to say well who are you to question the preacher that's just their attitude well we need to question any preacher that isn't declaring the word, declaring Christ, the word, from the scriptures. And so here we find Ezekiel given this task in his day, in his generation. But I want us to read from verse 6 down to verse 10 and see the further instructions that the Lord gives to Ezekiel, the prophet here. In verses 6 through 8, he says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious but thou son of man hear what I say unto thee be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house open thy mouth 
and eat that I give thee. And so he says, when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. A lot here as to how the Lord raises up his servants to go and declare his word. The first thing he tells him is to speak boldly, without fear. Don't be afraid. He says here of their words, first of all, and then he says don't be afraid of their looks. I've preached to a few people and congregations over the years where you can just see the teeth gritting. The clearer you made the message of Christ and God's glory apparent, the more you could see on the faces the, the anger. But we're not to be influenced either by men's frowns or even their smiles. That's why a lot of preachers like to preach what they do. They like getting people behind them and woohoo and a great message they do it for themselves but here the clear message to Ezekiel and that of any that the Lord has raised up is that they are to declare exactly the word as he says there in verse 7 thou shalt speak my words unto them years ago I had a mentor that told me that he said Ken you're going to preach a message that people are not going to want to hear but don't let the argument be with you. Let it be with this word. And when they go out that door, this is what they have to deal with, this word. And I've always remembered that. Your argument isn't with me. It's with this word. When people say, oh, are you saying that God decides who he'll save and who he won't? I'm not saying it. The word's saying it. Open your Bible and look at it. You're telling me that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't die for every single person in the world. I'm telling you that because that's what this word says. He died for those that the Father gave. So just to appease men, I'm not going to try to water this thing down. And like some preachers do, they say, well, there might be a sense in which Christ did die for every single person in the world. That might be your sense, but that's not what the scripture says. Christ said, I lay down my life for who? My sheep. My sheep hear my voice. And that's a comfort to me as a preacher because when I preach, I'm not trying to convince anybody. I'm preaching Christ with the promise that Christ said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That's how you find out who's sheep. <laughs> Set Christ forth as he is in the scripture. When they follow him, you have a pretty good inclination that they are the Lord's sheep. This is the part that people don't like. When in verse 6, you see how he describes the sinners that are rebellious and left to themselves. It's not a pretty view, is it? He calls them briars and thorns and scorpions. That's what man is in his depravity. You can't take a briar and turn it into a flower. You can't take a thorn and turn it into anything profitable. You can't take a goat and turn it into a sheep. So when the Lord says here that they are as briars and thorns and scorpions, all they can do is sting, they're full of poison, that's describing the depravity of the heart. And deadness without the life of Christ. So we shouldn't be surprised when we preach this message of Christ to sinners and they don't hear. I guess I'm always amazed when the Lord does cause one to hear. One here, one there. That's according to his will and purpose. And I'm thankful. But we're not trying to get people saved like you hear people talking about. No, that's the saving is God's doing. I'm just a voice that he's been pleased to raise up and declare 
his glory through this word. And even if that word hardens, which is what is indicated here with Ezekiel, just like Isaiah. We saw it in Isaiah. We saw it with Jeremiah. The Lord was raising these up to go out and to preach to a hardened people. But I stop and think about our Lord Jesus Christ. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But we don't walk away and think, oh, poor Jesus. Here he is, the, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the giver of life. And yet he did not give life to everybody. The majority turned thumbs down on him, would not hear him, rebelled against him, ultimately crucified him. But that didn't change why he came, because he didn't come to try to save anybody. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to the lost sheep to pay their ransom. And I can tell you this, his work is successful because every one of his sheep for whom he came to pay the sin debt is saved by his shed blood. It's just a matter of time now. We're waiting for him to call the rest. That's what he said he'd do. He'd call out every one that he died to save and did save. But here's the admonishment not to be afraid and uh, don't be dismayed by their looks whether they hear or whether they refuse, that's not our business. What's important and necessary is simply to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why he said there in verse 7, Hear what I say unto you. Thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they hear or whether they forbear. And he says in verse 8, Don't you become re rebellious in refusing to declare unto them the message that I gave you to do. That's what, really what preachers are when they compromise the message for fear of losing people. It's like one preacher told me one time, he said, well, I believe what you're preaching, but if I preached that in my congregation, there wouldn't be anybody left. And I said, well, you must not believe it then. Because David said, I believe, therefore have I spoken. And uh, I know this, there's going to be a lot of people leaving. That's the chaff that the Lord takes away, but I'll tell you what's going to remain is the wheat. And I'll tell you, as far as the Lord has taught me over the years, that's made the ministry for me comfortable. Because I know that any that do come, and I'm always surprised to see when people come back, and then they come back again, all I'm doing is setting Christ forth. And if they come back and express a hunger and desire to hear more, there's an indication that the Lord's doing his work. But before this message can be preached to others, you notice what it says here in verse 9, When I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me. Some commentators say, well, that was an angel bringing it. No, this hand was none other than Christ himself. That's the hand of God. That's the one in whose hand Christ said the Father has put this people. And that same hand, I know the Lord Jesus Christ had not yet come to this earth, but his coming to earth, that wasn't his, the beginning of his existence. All the way back there in Genesis 1 when it says, In the beginning God created heaven and earth. Then you go over to John chapter 1, and you read there that without him, that is Christ was nothing made that was made. All things are made by him. In fact, Christ said that with regard to salvation or judgment. He said, the Father judges no man, but has put all judgment into the hand of the Son. So that's the same hand that we see here. Whenever you see the hand of God in the Old Testament, it is speaking anthropomorphically morphically which just means in, in a figure of a man speaking of a hand we know God doesn't have a hand but he does in his son and when he came to this earth that's what John spoke about when he said that uh, in him was life and our eyes have seen that life and our hands what touched that life that's why he came in the flesh but here 
it would be a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ delivering his word. Here it's written as a roll of a book that was therein. I believe it's what we're reading right now. What we're reading in Ezekiel, Ezekiel didn't just sit down and go into a trance, but this was given to him, the Spirit directing him to write these things. But before he was to go out and declare this to others, you see there in verse 10, he spread it before me, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was written within and without. This shows that this is a particular revelation of Christ because typically scrolls were only written on one side. When it says within and without, that tells you then that this was supernatural. And he said there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. See, the, the message that we have to deliver is a double-edged sword. It is a message of salvation for those that God has purposed to save, but it is a message of condemnation for those that will not hear. But in verse 8, when he says to him, Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. See, what I'm preaching for you right now, I've already eaten. And now I've prepared it to give it to you. But if this word has not had its effect on my own heart, then anything I have to say to you is just going to be a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And sadly, there are a lot of preachers. All they're trying to do is put together a good message that people will like with a nice alliterated outline and give information. That's not preaching. Preaching is a declaration. It's a proclamation concerning God, how he saved sinners through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how all of history from Genesis through Revelation is about the son. But you stop and think about the metaphor here. I don't believe that he literally sat down and chewed this scroll this is speaking figuratively to eat. Just like Christ said, unless a man eat his flesh or drink his blood. He's not talking about physically eating his flesh or drinking his blood. But the flesh represents who he is in his person come in the flesh. And his blood has to do with his death. So to eat his flesh and drink his blood is to partake of that message of Christ and him crucified. And seeing that he is all of salvation. And that life that he came and lived, he earned and established that righteousness necessary for God to justify the people that he came to save and then shed his blood. That's all of our portion. He's the bread of life. We partake of him. And uh, when we hear of his death, his shed blood unto death, we, it's as if we're drinking his blood, but it's metaphorically speaking. But there's a lot about eating that has parallels with what it is to believe on Christ, to receive him. That word receive means to welcome him, partake of him. By his spirit, he enters in to you, just like food enters in. I've often said you can take a lot away from me Today, you can strip me of everything I have or own, but one thing you can't do is take away the meal I had earlier. It's in my blood. <laughs> You'd have to kill me to get it. But that's what it is to partake of Christ and uh, have him revealed in the heart. You know, you stop and think about eating. It's a deliberate action. How many times have you gone along for a while and you thought, oh, I haven't eaten anything today. No wonder I'm feeling weak. And what do you do? You go and sit down, you find some food, and you eat it. What you're doing here is a deliberate action. You didn't decide to do this yourself. You got hungry. And you're thinking, hey, this is Wednesday. I'm going to go sit down and eat. I want to partake of Christ. It also speaks of readiness. We used to sing that song as kids. Here I sit, we sit like birds in the wilderness waiting to be fed. We bang the table with fork. 
You could smell the food, but it wasn't served yet. But there's a readiness. I love that about when we gather here. There's a readiness to hear of Christ. And uh, what does eating involve? Repetitive chewing. <laughs> it's not like we just, like dogs, you know, sometimes you give your dog a treat and it's gone. And he's ready for some more. And I say that to my dog every once in a while. Why don't you chew it? Enjoy it. What we're doing is chewing this word. Meditating. That's what meditating is. But it involves a digestive process. Once we've eaten it, it's, it becomes a part of our being. How many times have you left here and gone back and thought, what was that scripture we were just looking at? And you go back and you read it, and the Lord continues to bless you through his word. That's what's important. And that's all part of the, the eating. It's necessary. We need the food. But oh, how sweet it is when we partake by God's grace and mercy. So this is what the Lord gave to Ezekiel, that he might declare unto that generation, hardened though it was, the very message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a mercy that today we still have this word preserved for us to be able to hear of Christ and partake of him. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would continue to bless our worship time and pray that you would indeed continue to open our hearts to Christ, that we might partake of him. Thankful for his person. Thank you for his shed blood, which is all of our salvation. We give you the praise and honor and glory in his precious name. Amen. Let's take our hymn book, and we're going to turn to hymn number 475. We're not going to follow the notes in the book on this one. I'd like to teach you another tune that for some time I've known, but we've never sung it here, I don't believe, but we'll sing this to that tune, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. It'll be a little bit difficult maybe the first time through, but after you get the, the tune in your mind, it'll be, it'll be easier. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. I know I shall see in His beauty the King in whose law I delight. Who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Just a little different tune, but one that I've enjoyed singing over the years. 
Let's take our Bibles and look in Esther chapter 10. And this is our final message in Esther. This is one of those that, like a good book, when you're done, you want to go back and read it again. We're going to move on from here. Lord willing, starting next time, we're going to start looking at some of the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. A little shift from the Old Testament to the New. But Esther chapter 10, just three verses here. And I've entitled this message, Day of Deliverance and Rejoicing. Day of Deliverance and Rejoicing. We saw that in our study in Psalm 118, where it's a scripture that people like to say, you know, if it's a beautiful day, they go, well, this is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. But if you go back there and look in the context, he's talking about the day of redemption. He's talking about the day of salvation, where Christ came in the flesh and laid down his life. And that's the day that the Lord has made for his people and uh, is all of their rejoicing. Well, it's typified here in the book of Esther. Remember, the sentence was sent out against the Jews. And it was Mordecai that stood up to intervene. And Mordecai, as a type of Christ, was the object of Haman's disdain, the spirit of Antichrist. But he endured that on behalf of that people. And Esther represents the church for whom this intervention was made. And so now, in verse 1 of chapter 10 of Esther, we read, And the king Ahasuerus laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and his might, and what? The declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, promoted him, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles, not of this word here, what we have is here in Esther, but it says, of the kings of, the Me of Media and Persia. And you can actually go back, they found some of these chronicles and writings where Mordecai is mentioned. Not that we need extra biblical proof that what we're reading here is true, but there's all kinds of proof out there in the history of this world that does nothing but confirm what we're reading right here in the scriptures. You'll never have to worry about archaeologists ever digging up anything that is going to contradict what the scriptures have already said. Somebody should have figured that out long ago, the Flat Earth Society, when they first thought that that if you kept going far enough, you'd fall off the end of the world. You know, the Isaiah speaks of the Lord sitting on the circle of the earth. Somebody missed that verse somehow. But here it says, For Mordecai, the Jew, was next unto King Ahasuerus. That's an amazing thing. Think of Joseph back in Genesis that was promoted to be Pharaoh's authority. And that any that wanted anything from the land had to come through him. Well, this is a, just like Joseph was a picture of Christ and his sufferings. And then his exaltation. The same we have here parallel with Mordecai and his sufferings and his exaltation. It says not only Mordecai the Jew... And that's an important word. Wherever you see that word Jew, it speaks of the tribe of Judah. Well, Christ was to come from the tribe of Judah. So we can see why this is so significant here. Why especially Mordecai? Why this preservation of the Jews? Well, it's because God had already purposed that his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, should come through that people. And so... He was next unto King Ahasuerus and great among the Jews. I like that no matter how great the Lord Jesus Christ is among the nations, for his people, there's none greater. 
and accepted of the multitude of what his brethren, <laughs> seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his seed. Don't you see a picture of Christ there? That in Christ we find all of our wealth in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and in him we find peace unto all his seed. So last time over in Esther chapter 9 we looked at how all of this culminated or climaxed with Mordecai being promoted. There we'll move back just a little bit in verse 20 where Mordecai wrote the things pertaining to the people for their protection even that Ahasuerus told him to write the decree that would in essence put a stay to the execution that had already been set up a year previous and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus both nigh and far to establish this among them that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly. This was the day of deliverance whereby they were to have been executed but now God turned that decree to the favor of the people that they should be protected and should not die. So we can see here again that when it says that this was to be a feast day, the 15th day of the same yearly, in verse 22, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day. Like I've always said, that word good in English is a derivative of the word God. It's a God day. When we talk about the day of the Lord, here was a stay of execution. But what, what is our day in which we have rested from our enemies? It was when Christ died. In his life and his death, he was victorious over every enemy of the church. Whether it had to do with the world, whether it had to do with Satan, whether it had to do with sin, our own flesh. These are all enemies that would easily condemn us were it not that Christ had paid the debt, interposed his precious blood. And so I see that typified here in this day. And it became a day of feasting and joy. As we saw last time, feasting involved what? Sacrifice. In fact, this day, the 14th day of the month, Adar, was just two weeks before the actual Passover. The next month was the Passover month. So all of this was preparation for the Passover. That's why I say even symbolically here, this day of deliverance was forward looking to Christ our Passover, wherein uh, we have been made to be at peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ from any enemy there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And you can see how they were to celebrate that day. It says it should make them days of feasting and joy. Talk about days of feasting. With regard to even the, the week that Christ died, there was a, a week-long celebration of unleavened bread leading up to the Passover lamb being slain and uh, Christ fulfilling it when Christ came. But for us, I think of the days of feasting and joy. We celebrate that day in which the Lord Jesus Christ paid the debt. And it says of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. So this was an observance that was to take place that became known as the Feast of the Purim. You can see verse 26, we saw that last time. They called these days Purim. And that word Purim actually signifies to cast a lot. 
You remember when they were first going to condemn the Jews, Haman purposed that a lot should be cast for the day in which they should be executed. And as God purposed, that lot was cast for a day that was going to be a year removed. So it was not to be immediately executed. God purposed that. The scriptures speak there of the lot being cast into the lap, but the disposing thereof is of the Lord. That's a type of God's sovereign will and purpose. You think about just, they call it chance, but there's no chance. You cast the lot, God determines the outcome. And so this celebration here of the Purim, that's that Persian word which means a lot, it typifies God's sovereign purpose to deliver his people. Just like that ancient practice, they would do that to determine divine guidance. They would literally cast lots. And uh, here in this case, the lot being cast right down to the day and the time of their deliverance. They had purposed it for evil, just like Joseph said of his brothers, you purposed it for evil, but God meant it for good. You meant it for evil, God purposed it for good. That word purpose is a strong word in scripture. And we see the same thing here. This event, even though it was done casually a year previous, and they decided that day, that day was according to God's decision, not man's that he purposed that all of this should come to pass. That's why I say we see here in this example of how it is God has purposed to deliver his people. This is not by chance. I hear people say that from time to time. I just wish God would give everybody a chance. Salvation is not by chance. If any are brought to Christ, it's going to be according to his purpose and his will. If you look over in Ephesians chapter 1 with me, I just want to quote a couple of these scriptures. You can see what's set forth in the Old Testament as a type and a picture. We see in the New Testament fulfilled in Christ. What is the casting of the lot? What does that describe? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, because what they purposed for a condemnation, God turned to blessing. And just like in Adam... Those that God has purposed to save stood condemned in him, and yet God purposed even that in the coming of his son to be turned to blessing, the second Adam, the last Adam. But here it says in verse 3, Blessed be the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice, according as he hath chosen us, the casting of the lot was a choosing by which those that saw the lot cast, then they abided by that decision. Well, there's been a lot cast, not haphazardly, but according to God's purpose, there's been a choosing. It says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. This was before any of his people existed in time that we should be holy and without blame before him. And notice, keep reading. A lot of people just say in love and then they put a period. No, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us. That's the way to read it. Under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of whose will? His will. How is it that these Jews were delivered. It was when satisfaction was made. The decree went forth. And there were sacrifices made and offered in joy and feasting. All of that represents the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereby that people that God has chosen, on whom that lot has been cast, that they would be declared holy and without blame. How? Through the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ imputed to their account. So you can see the parallels there. And the fact that the name of this festival in verse 
26, Esther 9, would be a reminder of God's almighty power to deliver his people according to his own purpose, even though it was with the hands of wicked men that originally the lot was cast against them, yet God took that and turned it to the good, the salvation of his people. Just like with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures, Peter said that on the day of Pentecost, that it was according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2.23, that you by wicked hands have taken and crucified. The wicked hands were directed against the Jews and they thought them ill and yet the Lord purposed that that evil be turned to good when they crucified our Lord Jesus Christ. They were doing their will in wanting to crucify him and yet all the while they were accomplishing God's will. They delivered up the Lamb of God. These were the priests. But they didn't see it that way. But all the while according to God's determinate counsel and foreknowledge. That word foreknowledge in scripture where you see it, it doesn't mean that God looked down and saw how men would act and then he reacted no God's foreknowledge is God knowing ahead of time foreknowledge what he has decreed that's why it's foreknowledge how does he know ahead of time because he decreed it we don't know one second from now what God has determined but I'll tell you this you can look back on your life I don't care how windy and and uh, up and down and thorny that pathway everybody one of us has a different path but it's been the path that God has traced and that's how we can rest in some things that perhaps have taken place and we've wondered about well I know this whatever the second cause first cause is God himself and that's what this day was reminding these of it had been meant and determined as a day of destruction for the Jews. And yet, the Lord purposed it for their blessing. Over in Proverbs chapter 21, this is the God of Scripture. It's not a wannabe God and I sure wish, woulda, coulda, shoulda type God. <laughs> That's not the God of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1, look what it says here. The king's heart. In this story, who's, who's the king? Well, it's Ahasuerus. A wicked king. One which was ruthless and brutal and barbaric. He didn't even hesitate when they Haman came to him and said, Let's kill off all these, these Jews. He was accustomed to slaughter. And yet it says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. That's the God of, of scripture. That's the God we see here. And so this day of the casting of the lot, Purim. Again, that's a Persian word, but it signifies a lot being cast. We talk about that, don't we? Our lot is cast as far as how God has determined it. We don't determine our way, God does. And so my prayer is that the Lord teach us to rejoice, just as this was a day of rejoicing. That's why I entitled this message a day of deliverance and what? Rejoicing. That the Lord teach us to rejoice and that's his sanctifying work. He, he takes these hearts that would otherwise complain and murmur and gives us joy in seeing his hand and all that he has determined and our blessedness being in that work that the Lord Jesus Christ alone has accomplished. Well, that's the story. Like I said, it's like a climax here leading up to this chapter 10 in these three verses here, what I've just entitled an epilogue. Have you ever read a book and it's all done, everything settled, and then, oh, there's one more page you turn over, addendum or epilogue? <laughs> That's what this is. 
chapter 10. It's, it's like what happened following all of this. And the first thing we see here is how the Lord directed, remember the, the, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. The story wasn't done just with this decree being set forth to spare the Jews. The Lord continues his work in mysterious ways. And here it says in verse 1 that the king of Ahasuerus laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea. Wherever you see that word tribute in the Hebrew, it refers to, this would be better rendered perhaps an imposed or forced labor. And you think, well, what kind of good can come from that? Well, the thought here of the writer of Esther, and we don't know who would have written this, we're not told, I would like to think that maybe even Mordecai, it was directed of the Lord as we saw earlier that he would write these things. But here would be God's mind revealed that now that Haman had fallen and that Mordecai was raised up in his stead, that this favor that was shown to Mordecai and through him, by him, to Esther and the Jewish nation actually had a result of the king himself having more dominion over the people than maybe what he had before. So at the same time that Mordecai was being blessed, here is the Lord prospering even this wicked king. The Lord does that. But why would he prosper this wicked king and especially when you read the word tribute there, you would think, well, that's not a good thing. That means imposing. But what it's showing is that from this time forward, Ahasuerus had had civil war on his hands. And what this word is saying is that through what the Lord did here, now he brought unity. Now this king was truly reigning as he could never have done had the Lord not done this. And it wasn't, even though he, was, he had authority over all this land, yet he didn't have the power over it until God gave it to him. So the Lord was shoring up even his kingdom, evil though he was, and I believe for one purpose, to con continue to bless and prosper the Jews that were still living in that land. And so when it speaks here, that it was upon the land and upon the isles of the sea that would speak to adjacent islands, wherever it was, this is where the Lord purposed that now he should reign. But it was all for Mordecai's sake, just like everything that God does in this world is what? Christ's sake. If he prospers a nation and a kingdom, I truly believe it's because in those places where he has his elect, He's going to prosper that people and that nation for their peace, for their tranquility. And then we see Mordecai then being promoted to this position of being second in uh, the kingdom. All of this, a lot of people ask me, well, how much time before Christ would this have taken place? Well, about 470 years. So... I think counting down 470 to zero and then the coming of our Lord in this world. Everything's counting down toward that time. But this would have been the time when Mordecai would have been raised up in greatness. And again, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning, not just over his people, but over nations. When Christ ascended on high. You remember what he said? All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who is it that reigns over the nations? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's directing all things even now. We look at it and think, boy, there's a lot of turmoil over here. There's a lot of unsettling over here. There's not one thing that takes place but what God 
has done it. And so if I were to make a couple of final observations here, number one, remember we started off by saying that the name of God is not even mentioned one time in the whole book of Esther, and yet you can't study through it without seeing God's hand in everything that was taking place. The number of events that took place here, we look at it and we say it must be God alone that accomplished these things, and to him alone be the glory. Think of all that God ordained and arranged in the story of Esther. That's why in Romans 8, 28, it says, we know that all things work together for good, but don't just stop there. A lot of people stop there when they quote that. Well, we know all things work together for good. What's the rest of the scripture say? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, and to them that are, what, the called. Don't forget those, that T-H-E. You can look it up, Romans 8, 28. The called according to his purpose. Who are those that love God? Those that are the called according to his purpose. How do you know you're of the called ones according to his purpose? You love God. You love this God. I don't want to hear about a little G-O-D that's in man's hands. I want to know this God of Scripture. And just stop and think about, in the story of Esther, wrapping this up, how God arranged from the beginning that Queen Vashti would lose her place. God, according to Scripture, Psalm 75, 7, he puts down and he raises another up. That's what he did. God purposed that there be a competition that would take place to replace Queen Vashti and all of these women throughout the kingdom brought. And who did Ahasuerus choose? Esther. I'm sure there's a bunch of beautiful women. They didn't send the ugly ones up there. But he set his heart upon Esther. Who did that? That was God. How did he work it out for Mordecai to be raised up into this position of authority and power that he did, even though he was hated by Haman. Well, in the end, Haman was hanged and Mordecai was glorified. Even like I talked about that cat, that lot being cast 11 months prior to determine this date according to God's decree. And yet when that day came, it turned against the enemies and not against Mordecai or his people. So we see that God's hand rules over all men, nations, all actions. There's not one thing that takes place but what God's will is accomplished. I don't know about you, but that's a comfort to me to know that in all things the Lord is directing. Well, I hope that's been beneficial to us and been a great, great book to study. Let's take our hymn books and turn to one final hymn, hymn number 16. This is a great hymn to sing in light of what we just heard. The Lord is King. The Lord is King. Lift up, lift up thy voice. Sing his praise, sing his praise. All heaven and earth before him now rejoice. Sing his praise. Sing his praise from world to world, the joy shall ring, for he alone is God and King. From sky to sky, his banners fling. Sing his praise, sing his praise. The Lord is King, let all his worth declare. Great is he, great is he. Bow to his will and trust his tender care. Great is he, great is he. Nor murmur at his wise decrees, nor doubt his steadfast promises. In humble faith fall on thy knees. Great is he, great is he. The Lord is King, and bow to Him ye must. God is great, God is good, 
The judge of all, to all is ever just. God is great, God is good. Holy and true are all his ways. Let every creature shout his praise. The Lord of hosts, ancient of days. God is great, God is good. The Lord is King throughout His vast domain. He is all, all in all. The Lord Jehovah evermore shall reign. He is all, all in all. Through earth and heaven one tongue shall sing. From heaven's own earth this anthem ring. Arise, ye saints, salute thy King, all thy days sing his praise. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed and look forward to next time, Lord willing.